thing, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening from uh, Miami. Uh, I'm John Quelch, the Dean of the Miami Herbert Business School. Uh, as you can see, I'm wearing my new U logo mask. Uh, but since uh, no one is in the office uh, at the moment, I'm going to be able to uh, take that off um, and really uh, want to welcome you for this wonderful uh, Distinguished Leaders Lecture Series sponsored by Southern Glazers Wine and Spirits. And tonight our special guest is uh, Bob Korn, the uh, founder and president of Carlisle uh, Aviation Partners. Uh, with me on the call this evening is uh, uh, Vice Dean Henrik Kronquist, uh, an expert in finance and especially in private equity. Uh, so I thought it would be very useful to have uh, Henrik uh, uh, ask uh, Bob uh, questions regarding the uh, funding structure and so on of this important uh, enterprise. Um, so Bob, uh, thanks uh, very much for being with us. Uh, you're headquartered down in Brickell, the Brickell district of Miami, and uh, you've been uh, a very good supporter of the university and also of uh, Miami Herbert Business School, sending a number of your uh, colleagues on uh, executive education development programs with us. We sincerely appreciate that. Um, let, let me just dive right in by asking you to explain what Carlisle Aviation Partners is, uh, how did it come about, and how did you yourself get into this business? Okay. Well, John, thanks, uh, thanks again for having me. Um, so, you know, Carlisle Aviation Partners, which was founded uh, just after 9-11 in Miami, uh, was founded as Apollo Aviation Group by myself and a partner, Bill Hoffman, who's a University of Miami law graduate. And what the company has become is an institutional asset manager, and we specialize in investing in aircraft and uh, aircraft-related uh, investments. So we buy Boeing and Airbus commercial aircraft, and we lease them to the commercial airlines. Um, well, this company started with much, much smaller and less uh, dynamic goals of just buying engines and disassembling them and selling parts, we quickly found that, you know, that the sum of the parts is often worth quite a bit more than the whole asset. So our, our specialty in our history is, you know, understanding the underlying value of the collateral of the assets that we're buying. And the company has grown to be one of the top 15 aircraft lessors in the world to the commercial airlines. And we've, we've gained strength from size, from capabilities, from our asset management skills, and from the ability with large pools of capital that we've been blessed to raise um, from institutional investors and primarily pensions and endowments uh, to create diverse pools of assets, Boeing and Airbus aircraft spread across uh, geographic uh, areas around the world. That's what attracted uh, the Carlisle Group to, uh, to approach Bill and I and through a mutual uh, um, party and ultimately culminated in us selling the business and joining them uh, in late 2018. And what, what, what's your own background, uh, Bob? Uh, how did you come to fall into this, uh, this space and lead but this I mean, company? It actually is a fall into it, John. I, uh, I'm a, an accounting and, and finance graduate from UCLA. I went to work in 1992 for a Fortune 500 aerospace parts manufacturer that ultimately I, I got my MBA while still in, in uh, working and went to work working on a program modifying commercial aircraft that ultimately led to me going to work in the late 90s for a large, the largest privately held commercial aircraft leasing company at the time and joining their marketing group. So after 9-11, when the business really was in the, the, the largest downturn ever until now, um, that company fractured and, uh, and Bill and I had known each other for years and thought it would be great to try to start a business together. So I moved to Miami and, uh, you know, began this, uh, what's become an 18 year uh, adventure um, in aviation and ultimately in private equity. You, you mentioned the 9-11 uh, crisis. And I, I think you have a, a very good historical perspective here because we're, we're obviously facing a crisis that, you know, may be somewhat similar, maybe worse than uh, the 9-11 crisis. 
what was the what was the pattern of response uh, by uh, uh, the industry uh, to the 9/11 crisis and the uh, drawdown in international and domestic travel that that caused? And then right. how did the how did the recovery cycle then kick in little a little bit later? How does that work? Well, I, I mean, step one or, or the the the, first, the cause obviously was the fear of flying. So the result was an immediate drop off in revenue for the airlines, so significant that many of them couldn't find a way to survive. So as a as a, a, a participant in the business, overnight there was a huge. Uh, availability of aircraft and excess supply in the chain. So we saw a significant uh, oversupply that led to aircraft going to the desert in storage, airlines going out of business. We saw, you know, destruction of profitability in the business because it's a very thin margin business that's based on volume um, and high load factors. Um, it's very similar to today. Um, the business recovers by that oversupply of aircraft um, being consumed through disassembling and retiring old airplanes, through the manufacturers at Boeing and Airbus reducing uh, the supply that they're putting into the market that ultimately meets the resurgence of demand. So demand recovered as people started to become more comfortable to fly again. So after 9-11, if you remember, metal detectors were introduced into the airports and people went through protocols of screening before they were allowed to fly. And at some point, we gained comfort that we were safe flying again. So if you think about a recovery like that, which you know we know it took five years for the industry to recover from that prior downturn, which was much less pronounced than this downturn, um, you know, it's, it's hard to speculate how long this downturn will take, whereas you know, we're, we're still seeing, you know, no more than 25% of the people that pre this crisis were, were flying, you know, go through TSA every day um, on a domestic uh, chart recently from China, their system has recovered domestically to operate almost 90% of the flights they were operating pre this crisis. But, but the international travel is extremely hurt and, and, you know, in single digits compared to where it was prior to this crisis. So, so, so in, in a situation like this, uh, Bob, uh, two, two things. How do you forecast, how do you model risk? Um, or do you just say, we're not doing any deals for the moment because we just can't assess the risk that's out there. And you just step back from the entire market until you know more. How do you respond? Well, I think that's a very, very... A sensible approach is to you have to decide in this business if you're spending money or you're investing money and if you don't know what your returns are going to be unless you're speculating on you know incubating you know startups which we're not we're buying hard assets and we're analyzing cash flows of those assets it's very it's almost impossible to predict the credit worthiness of an airline today given that the demand destruction has been so significant. Um, what history shows us is when an event like this occurs, asset values will tumble because there's, there's, much, there's plenty of supply but not much demand. And until those two meet at a new level, there'll be a continued drop to some floor. So we're looking today for that floor, but we're five or six months into this crisis. You know, history has shown us that floor may be established between nine to 12 to 15 months after the crisis begins. Um, so we can look to history to try to predict what may happen during this crisis. But I think there's, there's a little different between 9-11 and this one because we knew how to make people feel comfortable to fly and we were able to accomplish it with increased security very quickly. I don't think we've yet convinced many people that we have, they will have that confidence in getting on an airplane that they're safe today. I think that's our biggest challenge as an industry. Okay, let, let, let me ask you one more question then I'll hand over to Henrik. Uh, you, you indicated that you were the, in the top 15 in uh, the industry. Um, so it sounds like it might be uh, quite fra relatively fragmented. 
uh, how do you differentiate yourself? How do you stand out uh, in order to grow in what might be considered a somewhat cluttered environment, uh, especially in the current environment? Okay. Well, there, there's a couple of things. I mean, we to, to grow and to, to continue to remain in this business, your capital has to be very supportive and confident in your abilities to generate and develop, deliver profits. So, you know, we have spent many years building trust with our institutional investors. Other companies that are public, you know, they're delivering quarterly returns and quarterly results to gain confidence of the capital markets. So these, these 20 odd large um, investors like ourselves have different capital profiles, but each one of them has a different form of accountability, but all of us are accountable. Um, so we've chosen to differentiate ourselves primarily in the past by focusing on buying used airplanes. So at one point, and even now, we're one of the largest buyers of used airplanes. So the primary lessors that are, are on, many of them are publicly listed, um, look to dispose of aircraft uh, after they bought them between five and 10 years of age. And we've become a primary buyer of portfolios of aircraft from them, which allows them to renew their credit ratings and to renew their fleets for, old, for newer airplanes. We've chosen this position in the business because you know, frankly, we, we felt like we had an edge, which means we've become a very um, well built out platform that's capable of transitioning aircraft from airline A to airline B. So we're not afraid to get our hands dirty. We're not a financier. We're essentially a, an active participant in the airplane. So it's worked okay. well. Terrific. Uh, Henrik, uh, take over, please. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, Bob, uh, good to see you again. So, um, you know, let's talk a little bit about how Carlisle Aviation Partners fits into the Carlisle Group. Because normally when we think about a private equity fund, they uh, get their capital from limited partners and they invest that into portfolio companies. And first, I thought you guys were a portfolio company, but you're not. So how do you fit into the uh, broader Carlisle Group structure? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the Carlisle Group itself has become famous doing exactly what, what you've said. Um, at some point in the, the genesis and the growth of the Carlisle Group, um, they have built out a global credit group that today is very significant and invests in many different credit strategies. And the gentleman, Mark Jenkins, who runs that business, um, wanted to add an aviation strategy into his business. And we were fortunate enough to have been introduced to each other um, Bill and myself to Mark and, and to the Carlisle Group, and we found a lot of synergies and, and like-mindedness in discussing how we invest. And so we have, our, our, our firm essentially has become the aviation investing asset manager within the Carlisle Group, and together the Carlisle Group and our team raise capital in private equity funds that we invest in buying aircraft. Separately, the business is being grown um, vertically and horizontally to add financing strategies where we can offer additional products to our airline customers, such as financing pre-delivery deposits for the new aircraft, and we're and investing in asset-backed securities that finance their fleets. So, um, uh, Bob, uh, we should also encourage the audience to send in some questions through the chat function. So we already see a couple of questions coming in. Um, so then uh, in the meantime, while we wait also for audience questions, one thing that I'm interested in is that, um, you know, we have probably in the audience, we have a few uh, hardcore finance types, but we have also others that are not doing uh, fi professional finance uh, day to day. So maybe a parallel is to think about a car. Okay, so you can own it or you can lease it. You know, how does that work for airplanes? So give us the, uh, the basics here, the ABCs on how does this work? Well, it's, it's very similar. And you can think of it in a, in a, in a similar manner. Um, so most airlines lease a portion of their fleet. Um, today, I think roughly 40 to 45% of the world fleet that we fly on is not owned by the airlines that we fly on. And so when you're stepping on an airplane at American Airlines or United Airlines or Spirit or JetBlue in South Florida today, there's a, a better than, than uh, even chance that that aircraft is rented by the airline 
um, on a long-term basis. They're responsible for maintaining it, insuring it, operating it, and ultimately returning it to the lessor per a very specific set of return conditions, right? And this is a way for them to obtain financing for their fleet and to allow them to use their equity capital in other manners to, to grow their business and generate profits. And, and so, Bob, so what's the, if you're an airline, then how do you think about the choice, the 40% that you, you say, you know, on average, why 40%, why not 20, why not 80? How do you think about the choice between owning your own airplanes versus leasing? It's, it's a, is it about flexibility or is it about the cost of financing? Or how do you think about that choice from the airline's perspective? It, it's all of the above, Heinrich. It, 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 it's a very good question. So, you know, it's a different question for each airline, and it really depends in many respects on their ability to buy and finance their own airplanes and the cost of their capital. But essentially every airline does some form of leasing, whether it's operating leasing or financial leasing. Um, I, I like to think of it when we talk to airlines about why they should lease airplanes, that it does provide significant flexibility. It allows them to plan for retirements. And if we're buying airplanes from airlines, it allows them to capture and be secure on what their residual value that they'll recognize on their original investment, right? So then there's other airlines don't have the capital to own their own airplanes. And furthermore, don't have really the experience to be cognizant of the best execution on buying airplanes um, themselves. So they simply want to grow and grow rapidly in an environment where they can't necessarily access a significant amount of aircraft that they can buy. Um, and, and so you can think of it as supplemental lift when they're buying in used airplanes, or you can think about it as finding a way to exit aircraft in a planned methodical way. So, you know, to continuing on that parallel with cars and used cars, so sort of the, uh, the fact or the joke is that when you buy a new car, you drive it uh, out of the dealership, you know, then it, the, the value has immediately gone down by 20%. Um, you know, so how does that work for airplanes? What is sort of the price dynamics over time? You know, do, do they hold up in value or how do they change? And uh, can, can you give us a little bit about the dynamics here? It's very similar. There's a... There's a convention and conviction that aircraft have roughly a 25 year life cycle. Some airplanes are retired earlier, some airplanes last longer, some become freighters ultimately through conversions. Um, typically you see more depreciation in the first few years and certainly when it comes right off the car lot, as you would say, there is a significant depreciation. I think there's also a real differentiation when it's a lessor owned aircraft if it has a lease attached. So essentially a lease encumbered value might consider the cash flows that you're, uh, you're contractually obligated to receive from the asset. Because at the end of the day, we are a financier. We're of, of essentially, we're, we're a high yield credit type of product that is generating cash flow from the assets. So the value of the metal and its underlying utility is really a function of those cash flows that that airline would agree to pay us. Uh, so, so how does it work with an airplane? So, if the uh, you know the the joke about ski lifts is that you know they may start in Switzerland and then they are sold to uh, Italy and then they sort of go down the pecking order, is that a similar uh, trend uh, for uh, airplanes? It, you know, it, I think you can say more often than not it is. Um, we're moving airplanes today from one jurisdiction to another. Um, I wouldn't say all transitions are from the first world to the third world. We've seen plenty of transitions from, you know, from China, as we talked about earlier, to mainstream U.S. airlines that needed supplemental lift and found very good opportunities for not extremely old airplanes, but, but, but very good investments. Um, and we found aircraft move from Asia to Europe and vice versa. Um, but it is, it is similar that this is portable real estate. And that was one of the beauties during SARS or during MERS, where you had regional reduction in demand. So you were able to move assets from one area of the world to the other, where you had no change in demand. I think what we struggle with as an industry in this case is that 
we have essentially global demand reduction that we're trying to manage. So Bob, uh, I think many of us, we have seen those pictures from the desert uh, in Arizona with uh, you know so many airplanes that are parked there. And when I see those pictures, you can think about it one of two ways. One is that, oh my gosh, there's a lot of airplanes there. You gotta be able to cut a good deal if you're buying airplanes. Uh, on the other hand, you say to yourself, well, there's a reason why they are there and not in the air, right? So that, that might mean that you're not willing to pay so much for the airplane. So, you know, given these uh, inventories that are out there right now, is this, a, is this a good opportunity for buying airplanes? Can you cut a good deal or how should we think about that? Well, you can definitely cut a good deal uh, on some of those airplanes. I mean, I'd probably have more fun there than at Walmart. But, but when you have, I mean, as, an, as, an, as, a, as a buyer, you can go out and buy plenty of airplanes. As an investor, I, I return back to you have to understand and appreciate the, the cash flows that you're going to be able to generate from that asset. And the airlines are very, very wise. And they realize that they have the upper hand today if somebody's approaching them about taking delivery of an aircraft or, or leasing one from them. So, you know, it, it, it has to be a very well thought through step of making a purchase of an aircraft out of the desert today. Now, I will say some of those airplanes I see in those pictures, as I study those pictures, some of them look older than me. So I don't know that those pictures are necessarily accurate or affect everything that's going on in the desert. And some of them seem to be missing engines or doors or ray domes. So I'm not so sure that the process of disassembling some of those aircraft permanently had not already begun. So, um, you know, the deserts are a great place to store aircraft because it's, it's a good environment for aircraft um, to be preserved. Um, I read an article and I know a very a local Florida airline that's in the cargo business has just taken a factory built 747 freighter that has been stored in the desert for seven years and put it back in service. So it was very well preserved and it'll be a great airplane. Whereas um, other airplanes go to the desert and simply never come out. I think that in this case, you're gonna see a lot of the airplanes that the airlines flew to the desert go back in service over the next two to three years. We have a lot of good questions coming in. So we will turn to, to those questions very shortly. But one more that I have is that, you know, in any crisis, there are opportunities. So for, uh, for private equity, um, funds in the space of uh, you know, big assets, uh, air aircraft, for example. What are some of the opportunities that you think that uh, you will see over the next couple of years? A, I, I, can, I can answer that very, with, with a big smile on my face. Um, there, there's gonna be winners and losers in this business. Um, our business is cyclical and, and you know, investors who were well, well thought this out saw a natural end to the largest expansion in the United US economy ever, I think over the last 10 years. So I can tell you our firm and guidance from the, the overall Carlisle Group was to be very careful as we entered 2020 and mindful that the, the economy seemed to be starting to turn. And you know we had been positioning ourselves as such over the last year, whereas we saw a lot of new capital truly rushing in at the peak to, to invest. So, you know, as, as this crisis has played out and our industry is essentially in the eye of the storm, you know, um, I, I've told my boss for the last four months, I'm, uh, I'm in hand to hand combat essentially. Um, but, uh, uh, but in all seriousness, there's going to be, uh, lots of opportunities to buy portfolios of assets, to find uh, companies that are not going to be able to survive across many different industries connected to travel, connected to real estate. And, and we are, we'll look for opportunities to invest wisely as the cycle starts to, as we start to see, uh, you know, patches of, uh, of green sprouts and opportunities. Um, so it's, it's something that's already on our mind, um, but we're, we're patient and, and we like to think through strategies. We have uh, many great questions from our, uh, from our students, alumni and other members of the the uh, Miami Herbert community. So what, one interesting question that is coming in here is, uh, now that you have a, uh, a reduced in the demand for airline travel, you know, does that uh, lead to an elevated uh, number of defaults uh, on, uh, on the leases? 
Uh, and, uh, you know, what uh, are there some industry statistics that you can reference uh, on this point? I don't know if there's any public um, industry statistics. You know, I mean, I've read, I, I think I've read in, in, uh, in Bloomberg that over 30% of mall tenants haven't been paying their rentals, in some cases, 50%. And Americans, I've read this month, up to, I think it was one in three may not pay their mortgage. Um, you know, when you take money and revenue out of the airlines, I mean, they're going to struggle to make payments. The airlines have announced, and, and I think there was a public announcement from an airline in Brazil yesterday that they've agreed uh, restructurings with um, roughly 98% of the lessors and stakeholders um, that they do business with to help them manage their reduced cash flow through this period. So, you know, definitely um, I'm spending a significant amount of my time managing the existing portfolios to make sure we do everything we can to work with our customers to help them get from today back to a better period. You know, when we buy businesses as, and we invest in assets, we run lots of scenarios, the, the, the upside scenario, the downside scenario, positive five, positive 10, negative 10, negative 15. Imagine running a scenario where, you know, revenue goes down 100% and cost doesn't go away. I mean, it's, it's, it, any business has only so many months that they can survive this without some form of intervention, be it government or equity or, or other stakeholders in the business. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember I heard uh, when uh, Delta Airlines, they announced their earnings a couple of weeks ago, then basically they said that they were now at the same level as I think in 1985. That gives you uh, a perspective, right? Uh, on, the, on sort of the uh, in nominal dollars, the, uh, the reduction. Uh, another question, Bob, that is interesting is, uh, what is your outlook for the private equity industry in Miami and in Florida in general? And maybe, you know, if you, if you don't mind talking more broadly than air, aircraft and uh, air leasing as well, you know, what's, uh, what's your sense of the outlook? Well, I, we've, so we, I always tell people we're the, we were the largest company that nobody ever heard of in Miami until the Carlisle Group. Uh, you know, came and, and uh, became a participant in buying our business. Um, but the, the Miami Downtown Development Authority has had a very active program to encourage private equity uh, and hedge funds to relocate to South Florida. And we've seen um, a large uh, trend of people leaving uh, the Northeast and coming to Florida and taking advantage of the lower cost of doing business in Florida. Um, I think because we're less dense, uh, if, if you're worried about density of New York City, um, there's, it's a great opportunity to be here. Um, in terms of aviation, I arrived here uh, simply because this is such a center for aviation that finds its roots with Eastern and Pan Am and being the, the, the capital of Latin America where you know historically this was the meeting point for a lot, of, uh, a lot of leaders and businesses that were doing business within Latin America. So a, a transit hub and you know, many big airlines and then with them, the associated services um, grew within Miami, right? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, another question that is an interesting one that is also um, something that is, has been on the front pages of the, the business newspapers is of course, Boeing have had some challenges with some of their airplanes, the MAX uh, uh, plane, you know, has that been affecting uh, your company? Uh, and uh, if so, uh, how, how has that been affecting? Well, we, you know, we're obviously a big fan of Boeing because we own well over a hundred of their airplanes. Um, but we're not, a, we're not a buyer of new airplanes. So we, we haven't had an order or any experience, you know, with, with the aircraft, although I'm sure it'll be wonderful. Um, what it's, what has happened is because they haven't been delivering aircraft, there's been up until now a reduced delivery of new aircraft. And therefore we've been the beneficiary of airlines that were waiting for that aircraft, extending our older airplanes year by year by year, allowing us to earn additional revenue from our aircraft. So in a sense, we've been a beneficiary of reduced supply and, and constant demand, you know, created uh, some benefit for us in that manner. 
Uh, one, one, one other question, and I will hand over back to, to the Dean for some uh, additional questions. But uh, uh, I, I think a very interesting one is to go back to where you started, Bob. So I think that there are some, some folks that are on the call here. They're also in the business right now. They want to uh, you know, raise uh, private equity money. So what would you say, what were, you were successful, but what were some of the struggles and challenges that you faced? And what do you think made you successful back in the day when you started the business and you originally were able to raise money? Well, you'll, you'll, you'll laugh, but uh, you know, when we started, um, and, and yes, I, I'm here and I'm blessed to, to be working with the Carlisle Group and, and have access to, to a fantastic amount of capital, but when we started and we had no track record, um, you know, we were, we were blessed after a very long uh, exercise with Total Bank locally to get a $200,000 personally guaranteed credit line after we deposited $90,000 in CDs in the bank. So, you know, access to capital only came after a lot of personal begging, knowing the bankers um, for many years, my partner who had worked with them, and then being able to develop a track record. So I think, I think the key to anybody looking to start a business is going to be developing truly um, relationships and track record with people that are able to finance and provide you the capital. So after that, through the, that credit line, which ultimately grew um, a lot larger, we were able to, um, in 2004, um, form a partnership with Highbridge Capital, which, which became another fund called DB Zorn and Company. We were ultimately able to form a $100 million partnership. But you know, ultimately, that was their money, and they were the fiduciaries. We were simply the asset manager, and we brought transaction opportunities. It took us uh, until approximately 2010 before we raised the first capital that we were truly um, the asset manager and the fiduciary of our own fund. And that was a small fund as compared to today. Um, so, but the key to everything we did was you know, building, uh, building a track record, um, doing things the right way, you know, hiring the accountants that a company much bigger than yours would hire, hiring a big four accountant when you were very small, hiring, you know, significant lawyers before you were significant, acting as though you had a billion dollars to manage before you did, you know, allows you to, to, to aspire and grow into something that you want to be. Um, but th thanks a lot, Henrik. I really love that answer, Bob, because, uh, you know, the way to become a billion dollar company is to go out and hire people who know what a billion dollar company looks like and to grow through their wisdom and expertise. Uh, really appreciate that answer. Uh, so a couple of our uh, uh, audience members are asking, uh, well, what kind of opportunities might an MBA uh, look for in this business and what what would be the three or four skills that would be on your agenda when you're interviewing people uh, for possible uh, recruitment? Well, you know, every year um, for the last, I'd say, starting 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago in Miami and 10 years ago in Dublin, we've hired three to five MBAs um, fresh out of school, younger people with less experience and trained them starting in our pricing group, looking at pricing new opportunities. We're then growing in across the company into our credit groups, portfolio management groups where we analyze uh, you know, the debt side of transactions. You know, and, and ultimately we've promoted people into our marketing groups, into our asset management and, and re, you know, disposal groups. You know, people move within our company and grow. And, and it, we've, my view is you can hire very experienced people within the business that you didn't train, that likely acquired their skill set from somebody who does it their way, and you're going to pay a real premium for that person, or you can hire the smartest guy in the room with a really good um, mind that's been well-educated, that wants to learn, and you can train them in the manner that you would like to see them perform and ultimately get um, a much better person. You just have to be willing to spend the three to five years to train that person. So we like to point out to people all of the internal transfers, the promotions, people that have joined us and then left 
to, to other firms in very, very great roles. Um, so, and, and that's, you know, we started that before we joined the Carlisle Group, but even now as we've, we've joined with the Carlisle Group, we've been able to transfer people from Miami into their, uh, their businesses in New York. And there's even more opportunities for our people to receive training as well as to find internal opportunities within the firm. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question regarding uh, legal implications and liability issues um, in your business. Uh, the questioner says there seem to be many, many parties involved in the, the life of uh, an aircraft. Uh, how, how, how do you um, either contend with or lay off the legal liabilities that come with your uh, particular role? And if an airline goes bankrupt, are you left holding the, uh, the asset in the Arizona desert or have you somehow or other laid off that risk elsewhere like a reinsurance uh, company might? Well, I mean, I mean the, the first question is the legal side of it. First of all, I told you my partner is a UN law graduate. Right. And we probably have five more attorneys on staff and I think one of them who's a fantastic young lady is a UN law, law tax graduate. Um, but we, you know, this business is a financial services business and we spend an enormous amount of time and money. I think our, one of our largest departments is our legal and, and contracts department. And there a, a significant portion of our business is making sure the assets are properly insured, both for, you know, for damage as well as for liability. Um, so we have our own policy, but we rely also on the operators um, to, to insure us and our investors, you know, as they operate and maintain our assets. Um, so that, that is, it's a great question and it's something that's an extremely important part of our business. Um, okay. I, I, I have spent a lot of time um, meeting with our insurers and our underwriters, explaining to them exactly that question, how we manage and how we lay off risk to the airlines and to the people that maintain our assets um, you know, when they're being maintained. Because we, we're a financial intermediary. We don't do maintenance work on the assets and we don't operate them. We hire qualified parties to do that. Thanks. Uh, I'll tell you, when an airline goes bankrupt, John, just to finish your question, we are left with the airplane. We pray it's in the desert in Arizona. Normally we have to go find it and we have to arrange to get it flown. You know, just today as an example, we, have, we were blessed that an airline in Mexico um, really nice airline. It's an unfortunate uh, time with COVID. Did did help us in ferry an airplane back to us uh, here in into Lake City, Florida. But we're we're quickly around the world picking up a few airplanes here and there. All right, thanks. Um, so talk, talking about the uh, airline inventory again, uh, someone here is asking, uh, you know, are the Chinese airlines basically uh, bolstering global demand at the moment? You referred to the recovery of uh, domestic air travel in China. Are they active uh, buyers at the moment, uh, either out of the desert or directly new aircraft from uh, Boeing and Airbus? Well, I mean, there's been no orders, I'd say, since this all started. But okay. you know, clearly to us, um, I think it's, it's, it's no secret, Asia is the largest growth area for aviation. I mean, essentially, the U.S. is fully developed. But when you go to Southeast Asia, to China, to India, it's amazing the amount of growth in this business. And that's what's dri driving the growth in the ordering and delivery of new aircraft. And China has been an amazing partner to this industry buying up, I think, roughly one third of the new deliveries today over the last few years and having them delivered to their domestic airlines. Okay. Um, um, an another question here from uh, one of our uh, more impoverished audience members who apparently is in the market to purchase a long range aircraft himself. Um, so he, he's saying that uh, um, can't get any uh, paper or loans uh, from uh, the supplier uh, because of the uh, COVID crisis. In other words, the ability to buy the plane uh, is being stymied by 
what we were talking about earlier, uh, everybody saying, hey, uh, I'm just not uh, involved in any deals at the moment. So how, how, how does, I, I happen to know the gentleman and I, I, think, he's, I think he's good for the money, uh, but how, uh, how, how would you advise him at this point in time? Well, if, if he's looking to buy a long range private jet, I'm happy to introduce him to a, another Carlisle portfolio company that does finance private aircraft. We, we're, we only do commercial, but that might be interesting for him. Um, but that is one of the challenges right now. And one of the reasons that transactions are, are stymied is the lack of available finance. So, you know, going back to a comment I made earlier is that, you know, banks, if, if we see what's happening in, you know, industries that are in crisis, you're seeing the investment banks that all reported great profits, they're arranging capital for the leaders of these markets to help them make it through. And so I think there's going to be a real separation of winners and losers. And the winners are going to be those in our industry that can access capital first and, and make the opportunity to be successful and to essentially invest into the downturn of the cycle, you know, and invest wisely. Right. Um, I think you, may, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but I think it bears uh, 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 a little bit more conversation. Um, an audience member asks, what's the difference between financial and operational leasing? I think you referred to getting your hands dirty earlier. I, I presume that's what operational means here. But tell us a little bit more about the nitty gritty, nitty gritty of operational leasing and the, some of the issues and problems you get involved with. Well, you know, an aircraft has, a, has roughly a 25 year uh, economic life. Your, your normal expected first lease is 10 to 12 years. So you, you would hope and expect the airline will extend but that's not always the case. And in operational leasing, you know, that means you have to take a physically take an asset back and find a next customer. And if you're not fortunate to have him show up and inspect the airplane from the first airline with you, so you can take delivery together, you're taking that airplane, you're having it moved to the desert and you're managing the storage. And then when you do find the next airline, you're organizing the maintenance to get it ready to be delivered to that airline. So, you know, we have a, our own technical group of, you know, experienced airline maintenance people that don't do work, but oversee and manage our fleet so that we know where our airplanes are just about at all times and their maintenance condition. And we're planning for lease returns, we're managing the records so that if we do need to know what's going on, we have all the records and we can review and approve them. And, uh, and there's, so there's a lot of technical work that goes into operating leasing. Um, is, is, there, is there a standard Carfax report on aircraft, the equivalent of a Carfax there, report? There's a lot of them, and there's, there's actually quite a debate uh, about, you know, is, is there's such a disparity in values. I think you've got a group of about three or four appraisers that I think are the generally accepted parties. And, and there's a, uh, you know, we have an international society of transport aircraft traders that certifies appraisers. And there's different appraisers that the banks and the capital markets have adopted and found as the leaders. Uh, but you still find a real disparity of opinion. And, and you know, we struggle. Um, we've essentially, as an industry, take the average of three appraisers to, to get to a, uh, a value when you're, you're financing your portfolios. That, but that is a big issue, is, is understanding and, and establishing value. Is there a difference between Airbus and Boeing in terms of the uh, residual values of these aircraft, or are they basically now tracking each other? And I guess as a related question is, um, is there a difference between um, a GE engine and a Rolls-Royce engine, uh, et cetera, in terms of the, the valuation of these assets? I, I think the answer is yes. There's, there's, there is disparities. I think they, you know, it, it, it's hard to, to make a real statement that says one depreciates faster than the other. I think there's, you know, different airlines. I think, I think the issue is you take an airline 
uh, you think the 737, there's no um, option. You take your GE engine, that's the only engine available, where on the Airbus comparable, you can choose between a GE engine and a Pratt Whitney engine. So, you know, there's differences in the airplane within itself, and that may drive disparity in value. Um, the different engines may have different fuel economies. So if their operating economics and their maintenance economics are different, that may lead to a different value in the underlying asset. Um, but, but I think by and large, they track to a 25 year depreciation schedule. And, and I'd say by and large, because you know, Airbus and Boeing are both in a very competitive and uh, a duopoly, pricing has a way of finding a level set field on new aircraft. If uh, there was, if there was uh, consolidation within the aviation sector uh, as a result of the uh, COVID crisis, uh, would that affect in any way your relative uh, power as the uh, person involved in the leasing? Well, we certainly have seen in the U.S. an incredible consolidation down to only a few small mega airlines. Uh, a few, few mega airlines in, in small in number. Um, I think there's been a lot of speculation that Europe will, but has yet to go through that process and that there'll be a larger consolidation within Europe. At the same time, some of these the consolidation has happened by virtue of large airlines buying up smaller brands. Um, but, but certainly if you have a larger airline and you have fewer buyers, they're going to have a much bigger purchasing power. There's no doubt about that. Okay. Uh, I think you, you touched on this earlier, but I think it bears uh, re-asking. Um, someone asks the question, why, why do you uh, finance through asset-backed securitizations? And can individual investors uh, have opportunities to participate in those, uh, in those uh, financings? Well, I mean, we have become, you know, blessed to be the largest issuer of aircraft asset-backed securities um, in the last uh, five years. Um, we've issued more transactions than anybody else. And it's simply because the aircraft that we buy, that we talked about, midlife aircraft, we've found the most efficient way to finance our assets is through the capital markets and through ABS transactions. These aircraft move around. So these kind of structures give us a lot of flexibility to move aircraft from airline A to aircraft airline B. Um, and we've been able to achieve, you know, really optimized results that allow us to deliver acceptable returns to our investors. Uh, uh, do you in involve yourself in brokering deals or are you always just uh, determined to own the asset? Well, our, our business really is based around investing in aircraft on behalf of our institutional investors that invest in our funds. So I, I, we, we really haven't diverted from that. Um, and we, re, we really remain focused on working for our investors. Okay. Do, uh, maybe this is uh, just a little bit beyond the uh, scope of your business, but I think it's an interesting question. Um, there has been some buoyancy in market demand for private jet service uh, on net jets and uh, similar type uh, um, com with net jets and similar type companies. So uh, do you see any uh, possibility of extending your business into the, the small private jet market or will you just be sticking with the uh, commercial Airbus and uh, uh, Boeing? Uh, fleets? Well, you know, across Carlisle, as I said, there's other areas yes. of the firm that do invest in other products. You know, from my standpoint, I can, I can tell you honestly, I have my area of expertise. Um, we, we might think, and we are looking to grow our business horizontally, John. So we're looking to raise capital to invest in newer aircraft down the road. That's something we think about. Um, but we're, we're not, um, I don't think I can speak for myself. You know, my success has been investing in products that I'm very knowledgeable of, and, and I wouldn't be able to speak as an expert in that type of equipment. Right. Um, 
let, let me ask you, it's sort of a cheeky question, but we're closing in on the uh, end of the webinar, so I feel I can, you know, maybe uh, uh, ask it on behalf of one of our guests says, uh, uh, how do you, how are you compensated? What determines how you are rewarded? Uh, I think he means in the context of the pantheon of Carlisle Group, you know, how, how do the higher ups, how does Rubenstein at the top of the Carlisle Pyramid uh, look upon Carlisle Aviation Partners and determine, if he does uh, in any way, determine how much you make a year? Well, I can honestly say that uh, David and I have not chatted about my compensation this year, but um, look, Bill and I, Bill and I were torn about selling our business. We realized, on one hand, uh, we we were our own in, own bosses for 18 years, but right. we have a lot of we had a lot of people that work for us that are younger than us, and we wanted to find a way to make this business survive beyond us, and. In the Carlisle group, there's a lot of similar minded, very thoughtful guys like the three founders of the firm and the key guys that run it like Hussan Lee and Mark Jenkins. And they became great guys for us to work with and to steward this business into Carlisle. And all I can tell you is they've been extremely fair and generous with the entire firm. But I, but I think it's safe to say like in any job, you know, you earn your money. Yeah. And, and, and the way we earn our money is by generating profits for our investors and by doing a really good job of managing their money. Okay. Well, well, you know, I'm curious, it's sort of my own follow-up question, but um, when you were thinking about um, the transaction with Carlisle, how did you weigh the pros and cons of that? And what made you convinced to go with Carlisle? Maybe you had other 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 companies that were also interested in acquiring you. Uh, well, could you just talk us through your thought process? Yeah, we, we had actually gone through um, through a process to try to sell a part of the firm or all of the firm previously. So I think it really helped us understand because we saw some of the good, the bad, and the ugly from some of the other parties. Um, when this opportunity came up, um, and it was really through an introduction through a mutual party that knew both of us. Um, it was unexpected and it wasn't, it wasn't planned. Um, we had so many um, like-minded parts. We had, uh, we had touch points and people that we both knew in common that could give personal references and ways that the other did business for so many years. I think all of us became very confident and comfortable with the other very quickly. Um, you know, as you say, it's not, a, it's not an easy thing to decide to sell a business that's been yours for so long. But at the same time, you know, we realize this business is cyclical. We wouldn't have predicted the cycle would change the way it's changed. But we also knew that if we didn't make a decision that we were going to sell, we would run out of time before we faced a downturn and we wouldn't be able to sell the business. Um, and we realized that you don't, you don't find a firm with the, the Carlisle Group a name on the door and, and such, a, uh, such a firm so often. So, you know, sometimes uh, you can't always pick the time, but when the right guy shows up, um, you don't want to say no. Yeah, yeah. good. Um, fi final, uh, final question here that's come in, um, more the aviation sector arena. Um, with the uh, imminent recession, uh, do you expect to see a new um, wave of uh, uh, low-cost carriers or niche carriers, um, you know, such as Southwest or Spirit, etc.? Well, I think there's already been a few already actually announced, and uh, I do think we've seen an incredible growth in low-cost carriers. I think that's what's fueled the growth in Asia with the success of Air Asia and Lion Air and EasyJet in, in, and Ryanair in Europe and Spirit Southwest, uh, Frontier and JetBlue in, in the US. So I do think it's entirely possible. I do think there'll be 
uh, possibly new entrants and possibly consolidation. Um, but but I would expect a few new airlines to pop up. Okay, great. Uh, Henrik, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, uh, no, I think uh, it's been uh, extremely uh, useful to listen to you, Bob. I think uh, the, the last question I think is that it's also based on uh, some of the uh, questions that were coming in. If you were to uh, found a company all over again, you know, would that be one thing that you would do differently between when you originally founded a company and where you are now? I'm sure there are many, but if there's, if you can select one thing, what would you have done differently with 2020 hindsight, which is totally unfair, but still. It, it, it really is. That, that's a tough question because, you know, for everything, for everything we did, right or wrong, it got us to where we, we are. I think the one thing that we did right was everything was about personal relationships and honoring your word. And when you say you're going to do something, you do it. When you shake somebody's hand and you make a commitment, you honor it. And I think that's been a big success to our business is being able to look people in the eye, tell them you're going to do something. And then no matter how hard it is, no matter if it costs you more than you thought, takes longer, you honor your word. And 18 years later, you can look back and say, everything I ever promised anybody I would do, I honored my word, even if they didn't. Okay. Well, our promise to our audience is always that we end at uh, 6 p.m. promptly. Um, I want to thank you, Bob, for joining us. And uh, uh, just let our audience know that uh, uh, on August 19th, which is only one week from now, uh, we'll have uh, a special guest, uh, Scott Galloway, uh, who some of you may recognize his name. He's a uh, uh, frequent commentator on the future of higher education. Uh, and we thought it would be especially timely to have him uh, as a guest talking about how he sees the higher education sector going forward. And then on August 27th, we've got a magnificent event, a really you must not miss this one. Uh, this is uh, Georgie Paolo Lehman, uh, who is probably the most important business person in Brazil uh, of the 20th century. He is the founder of 3G Capital, uh, the firm that uh, uh, took over uh, Burger King, uh, turned it into Rest Restaurant Brands International, uh, acquired Anheuser-Busch, acquired Kraft Heinz, and uh, uh, that's going to be an extraordinary opportunity because uh, uh, Mr. Lehman uh, does very, very few of these events. So please make sure August 27th, it's on your calendar. That is an event because he is going to be in Europe that day. That will be at 11.30 a.m. to uh, 12.30 p.m. rather than our usual five o'clock time slot. Uh, once again, Bob... Uh, Magnificent to see you. Uh, uh, sartorial selection couldn't have been more appropriate. The juxtaposition of the you with the Carlisle Group. Uh, we see our brand as helping Carlisle uh, in this situation uh, elevate itself. Uh, but seriously, it's been uh, fantastic to have you give us insights into, you know, a business that none of us really think about and yet is. Uh, fundamentally so fascinating, especially uh, to all of us inter interested in uh, how finance makes the world go round. So thanks again for all of your support for the school and for being with us tonight. And good night to everyone from Miami. Good night.